Welcome. Uh, sorry about the show's running late tonight. It was the rest of the guys on the crew. They screwed up royally. And, and just between me and you, don't listen to anything those guys say. Okay? The rest of the crew, they're all crazy. I am the only person in the whole building that's sane. I promise you that. Yep. All right. Here we go. Let's get right to it, shall we? Sure we shall. Okay. Yeah, you know what the problem was? The crew, the, the the director on the last show, we went through the whole thing, thought we were producing. He forgot to press the actual transmit button. So we did the whole show, didn't record it, didn't transmit it, did anything. It was just like we were talking to the ether. He is so fired. But hey, you, during the you know, quarantine, you take what you can get in terms of workers. Okay, here we go. I'll catch you back. I remember what's happening. We were at Mari Say in the Pyramid in the Mayan, Yucatan, remember? Marise jumped off the rock pile and took off for the side opening of the mezzanine. When she got there, she slid on her boots across the last few feet of dirt and stone, stopping just before she exited the overhang of the pyramid. Outside, the sky was a bright shade of lavender and vermilion. That's where we stopped. So let's start the timer. Go. The strange colors stretched as far as you could see in all directions. As she watched the bands of color streak across the sky, she could suddenly tell the intermittent cloud cover was rapidly disappearing. Then, all the clouds were gone. After they disappeared, it got sunny, and the aurora colors were too bright to look at. Marise knew this was unusually bright, even for the tropics. As she looked down from the glowing clear sky, she saw where the cries of pain were coming from. Several workers had been down on the plaza removing debris. All of them were local natives and their skin had been hammered by the intense Central American sunlight their whole lives. Many of them had dark tans from constant work in the daylight with no shirts. As long as the men had plenty of water and some shade to siesta in during the hottest part of the day, they were fine. 
It was only a little before 10 in the morning. Although she and her working crew were hot and sweaty inside the pyramid, the day had not yet become stifling. But on the plaza in front of her, several workers that were shirtless were now yelling in pain and running for the protection of whatever shelter they could find. Most of them made it into the jungle on the plaza sides or into the many pop-up tents that dotted the huge mountaintop courtyard. Two other workers were carrying rubble down the side of the steep pyramid and were about halfway down the 40 feet to the bottom when the aurora began. They dropped the rocks they were carrying when the skin on their back and arms began to sunburn in front of their eyes. Both men took off running back up the pyramid and now jumped past Matisse into the protection of the mezzanine. They almost slid into the men who had quickly followed Matisse over to the opening. As the two sunburned laborers stood in front of the group, their exposed skin continued to redden visibly while everyone watched. One of the other workers reached out and slowly pressed his finger onto one of their bright red arms. It left a light pink circle the size of a quarter that quickly faded back into the deep red of his sunburned skin. The burned man almost backhanded his workmate, but suddenly the skin on his body started to sting even more. Jacinto jumped past the fried workers and looked out to the opening at the sky. Yo, boss, that's one of those solar showers that have been giving the whole world an aurora, but it's never been this bright before. Marise turned from the injured men in front of her and joined Jacinto to look out at the cloudless pink sky. It's never caused anything like this to happen either. She pointed down at the empty plaza and her men hiding from the daylight. As they both watched the show from their pyramid perch in the Yucatan, they couldn't see what was happening in orbit around their beautiful planet. It was probably best they didn't know. For the next hour, Marise and her men sat almost silently and watched the sky. The colors of the aurora faded in and out and wavered over the jungle for as far as they could see. It actually faded in and out over the entire sunlit side of the planet. But Marise, Jacinto, and her Mayan descendant crew didn't know that. They just knew the daily siesta had come early today, and tomorrow all of them would wear long sleeve shirts and a hat. That's the end of chapter 7. Chapter 8. Time remaining, 468 years. Location, Central America, Mayan, Yucatan. Year, current era, 1544 A.D. Pick him up again! The captain of the marauders spat the words out in Spanish as he stepped away from the barely moving figure on the floor in front of him. Conquistador Don Marco Fernando Castilla de Sevilla wasn't actually enjoying himself, not any longer. You could say he was not a happy man, if you could call him a man. He was more like a monster. Sweat was pouring off him from the effort he'd been putting into the torture of the current victim of his attention. He took a long drink of water and then wiped his hands and face as he looked back toward the two men who were just completing his order. The last surviving member of the High Council of Mayan Priest was on his knees being held up by his arms by two very large conquistadors. The Spaniards had removed all of their armor. The heat of the jungle was just too unbearable to keep it on any longer than was necessary for actual combat. In front of the kneeling priest was a pile of severed human tongues. There were over 260 tongues in the grotesque pile of lumpy, fly-covered flesh. Don Marco Fernando grabbed the translator, a frightened old Mayan man who himself looked like he had recently been the target of Don Marco Fernando's wrath, and threw him in front of the priest. The translator had been dragged along with the mercenary conquistadors and they had, as they had been ravaging the Yucatan Peninsula for the past several years. 
everyone and everything that was not Spanish in origin was used and abused like cheap property, and that included the translator. The translator will not survive the end of the week, but Don Marco Fernando won't care. He'll just get another translator. He and his men have been on a holy dual quest. First and foremost was to find the rumored hordes of gold and gems these savages had been moving and hiding from him. And second was the complete extermination of this vermin race of savages in this cursed and foul land of jungle and rot. The Mayan culture was in its final throes. Don Marco Fernando was there to help it along its way to extinction. Ask this savage one more time where the gold is hidden. Don Marco Fernando told the translator as he stood over him. Ask him what was in the box that was carried into the big pyramid and where did they hide it? Then the conquistador looked at the old man. You get him to tell me or I'll make you pay for this trickery, you worthless cur. You told me this was where the Mayans keep their greatest treasure, but I have found nothing. <coughs> Excuse me. The old Mayan translator quickly looked to the broken priest. He spoke in the native Mayan tongue, but his voice was barely over a whisper. Please, tell him where you keep the gold. Give him whatever you have. He will not stop until he finds it. The last surviving member of the Mayan High Council of Priests didn't lift his head. He could barely focus on the pile of tongues in front of him, tongues of his friends and his relatives. He knew that his tongue would be joining that pile shortly because he did not have the answer that the conquistador was so desperately looking for. He did not know where there was any amount of gold to satisfy the greedy Spanish invaders. The old man continued, You must tell him what you hid in the pyramid. He knows of the Mayan treasure. Please, you've seen what he will do. He glanced over at the pile of severed tongues on the floor. No gold or treasure can be worth your life. The priest did not raise his head, nor did he move. The half-dead priest knew that every piece of gold and gems had already been confiscated. There were no more stores of gold or precious stones anywhere on this mountaintop complex. But it was no use trying to explain that. It would only result in your tongue being separated from your head, possibly while you were still alive to see it. As for the other treasure, he was sure the murderous Spaniards did not know of the precious stone tablet that held his god. And the treasure must have successfully been stored in the secret room, or else they would not still be asking for it, which meant his god was safe. These beasts would not feel, find and steal his God, and he would not betray his God even at the risk of death and dismemberment. This final thought brought a flash of peace and serenity to the last surviving member of the Mayan High Council of Priests, but it didn't last long. Just as the half-dead man was about to let go and surrender to impending death, he heard the screams. They were coming from a couple of rooms away. All of the young girls were gathered up by the foul conquistadors after the massacre had subsided. They were held in a large group all night, like a corral of horses, just outside this set of rooms in the communal living quarters of the Temple Plaza. The group of girls were being held right next to the huge pile of bodies from Don Marco Fernando's torturous tantrum. All night and all morning long, the stripped naked girls were led by small groups into the closest room to the trapped and frightened young Mayans. On the other side of the barricade, a line of half-naked conquistadors extended out of the door to the room. The scream pierced the air again. The priest recognized this scream. The last surviving member of the Mayan High Council of Priests heard his virgin baby girl of only twelve being raped by the filthy, stinking, long-haired men with metal skin. This was all he could stand. The last surviving member of the Mayan High Council of Priests, the last man on earth 
that knew the real reason the Maya were able to achieve all they had all that they had achieved over the two millennia they had thrived. The last man who knew of the existence and location of the God in the clear rock exploded up and charged the gruesome monster who had been torturing him for the last 20 minutes. With every muscle in his body responding to his fury, the priest threw up his arms and lunged toward the neck of the conquistador Don Marco Fernando Castilla de Sevilla, who was only a few feet in front of him, but he never reached him. Although the priest was able to pull his arms free from the loose grip of the conquistadors who stood by his side, Don Marco Fernando reacted before the naked priest could even blink. As the wide-eyed priest looked down, he could see the thin blade of the Spanish steel sticking in through his stomach moments before he felt the first pain. The blade pierced all the way through him and stuck out his back about a foot. The priest had only seconds to live as he watched the evil grimace of conquistador Don Marco Fernando Castilla de Sevilla grow wider. Then Don Marco Fernando lifted the blade up with both hands and severed the spine of the last surviving member of the Mayan High Council of Priests. After holding the weight of the priest on the sword for a few seconds, he pushed the man noiselessly off his dull, bloody blade. The priest collapsed in a paralyzed heap on the floor as the conquistador commander cursed under his breath. The two conquistadors who had been holding the priest quickly reached down and grabbed his shoulders again and lifted him up. The man's useless and paralyzed legs stayed limply attached to the floor and his head rolled listlessly forward. One of the torturers pulled the priest's head back by the braided hair on his head. The priest's eyes rolled uselessly around in their sockets, but he was still barely alive. Conquistador Don Marco Fernando Castilla de Sevilla then walked up to the helpless and dying priest. Without saying a word, he reached out and roughly pulled down the man's jaw that was partially hanging open. Then he used a pair of iron pliers to grab his tongue and pull it unnaturally out of his head. Don Marco stepped around to the side, then used the same Spanish steel blade to sever the tongue of the quickly dying man. He tossed the tongue on the pile and silently motioned his men. The two conquistadors balanced the body of the Mayan priest on his own stooped torso. One of them lifted up the hair of the tongueless man, straightening out his neck while the other man stepped back. Then Don Marco Fernando Castilla de Sevilla spun around with his sword and swung it like a bat into the neck of the priest. But the blade only made it a little over, over halfway through, leaving the steel sword sticking out the side of the paralyzed man's throat. Don Marco cursed as he pulled out the blade. Damn it to the fires of hell! I despise this cursed wetland! You cannot even keep a blade sharp in all this wet foulness! As Don Marco inspected the blade of his sword, the marionette conquistador let go of the priest's hair and his body collapsed back onto the floor. The head of the priest flipped over and back, only connected by the piece of skin and muscle that Don Marco's blade was too dull to cut through. We'll stop right there. There. Okay. So, that's it. Let's clear that back. There we go. Reset it. And take that out. Okay. That was it. Sorry that it shows late, but like I said, it was the crew. You guys don't trust them. Okay. All right. That's it.
just the facts, ma'am.